Well, everybody showed up in here tonight. Pray the Lord shows up, and He will. He showed up Sunday, didn't He? Yes, sir, buddy. He showed up Sunday. Would you turn to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, with me tonight, please? Zechariah, chapter number 12. Now, what you've noticed in verse number one, the Bible said, the burden of the word of the Lord for, look at that word right there, Israel. See that? All right. Saith the Lord, Jehovah, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which stretcheth forth the heavens, layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, that prophecy there is well over 2,400 years old. That's a long time ago. And notice that word Israel goes all the way back to the book of Genesis when God took a man who was a usurper, who was a supplanter, and at, uh, and at Peniel, which means face to face with God, he changed his name from Jacob to what? That's right, he did. He changed it from Jacob to Israel. So the word Israel shows up for the first time in the Bible. So what does that mean? It means it's ancient. It's ancient. It's old. Israel is the way they say it over there. Like they say Yerushalayim, and we say Jerusalem, they say Yerushalayim. They don't pronounce the J like we do. Uh, most languages don't have a J in it. English is one of the unique languages that does. Yerushalayim, city of peace. Yisrael, prince or with power with God. So therefore in the mind of God, Israel is an old ancient nation with an old ancient people. They didn't show up yesterday. They have an old ancient custom of culture, identity, and place on this earth. In the latter part of the 1800s, a man by the name of Theodore Herzl he said was moved by God to start what's called the Zionist movement to establish a homeland once again for the Jewish people. In the latter part of the 1800s, they didn't have a homeland. They were scattered everywhere on the earth in the diaspora. So in Basel, Switzerland, they met with the first Zionist Congress with the sole purpose or the stated purpose of establishing a homeland for Israel, for the people of Israel, people of the Jewish people. In World War I, which was the war to win, to, to the war to end all wars, and it was only the first of the big wars, but World War I, a Jew was instrumental in developing cordite gunpowder. That helped. Great Britain win World War I. Because of his influence and because of his contribution to the war effort, they asked him what he wanted. He said, I want a homeland for my people. I want a homeland for my people, my people, the Jew. And so uh, Great Britain set about to help Israel to uh, immigrate or migrate or whatever you want to call it into Palestine. That's what it was called at that time. The word Palestine comes from a, a uh, Roman word that uh, Hadrian gave to the land about 160, 170, I forget exactly the date. He called it Palestina. And he changed the name from Israel to Palestina. And the reason he did that is because he wanted to change the identity of the land from the land of Israel, the Jew, to the land of the Philistine, their ancient enemy. So that's where, that's where the word Palestine come from. 
It was a, uh, it was a derisive term. It was a term of mockery set by the Roman when they had that, that kind of power. It stuck. And so it's called to this day Palestine. But of course you and I both know that Palestine is a, is a secular reference to Israel. So they set about to uh, help the Jew to immigrate or migrate into his country. Well, Arab opposition brought about a change of policy and Great Britain came out with a notorious white paper. The white paper limited severely the immigration of Jews into the Holy Land. That was to appease the Arabs because they wanted Arab oil, just like they did now, they do now, did then, they do now, always have. Arab oil. The Arabs sit on oceans of oil. And so uh, they, uh, they, uh, they did that to appease them. So the white paper. So it makes no difference though what uh, Great Britain did as far as trying to limit the, uh, the uh, immigration. World War II sped everything up again. Because when World War II was over with, uh, Europe had on their hands hundreds of thousands of displaced Jews, refugees. They had to do something with them. Some of the nations were turned a real cold shoulder to them and told them to go back to the land of Germany where they had the, uh, the uh, ovens, the concentration camps. They turned their back on Israel and the Jewish people. That's one of the most sordid times in the history of the world. Go back and read that time, right after World War II, how the world treated the Jew. But some nations were friendly toward them. The United States, kind of. But what happened eventually was that Israel got into the land, even if they had to break the law, and eventually through terrorist activities, if you want to call it that, Great Britain, which had a mandate from the United Nations to control the land, watch over it, administer it, because there was a constant conflict between the Jews that had come in and the Arabs that were there. Great Britain was trying to play the part of peacemaker. But in any event, uh, the King David Hotel was blown up by Menachem Begin, the Stern Gang, and a few other people. And when that happened, uh, Great Britain said enough of it, we're finished, with, we're finished with this place, we want out. And I don't know exactly the date involved, but when Great Britain pulled out, of the Holy Land and they acted as an intermediary, you know, like the UN does today, peacekeepers. The day they pulled out of the Holy Land, the next day, that little country right over there was embroiled in war. It was the fight or it was the war of independence. Israel fought for its survival. It fought the war of independence and it fought it immediately when Great Britain pulled out of the Holy Land. They won that war of independence. A little ragtag army. You ought to go back and look at some of the photographs of their air force. Look at some of the planes that Israel had uh, that they used for their air force and their army. And uh, they had no standing army. Uh, not like, uh, not like, you know, obviously not like they do today. And they were attacked on every side by Arab armies. And if you want to talk about a miracle today, talk about the miracle of Israel becoming a nation. How they ever did that. But they did. And on May the 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion stood up and declared that Israel was a sovereign nation once again, and that it was, uh, it was there planted there by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's your God, by the way. Amen. Your God's not the God of those monkeys climbing, the hill, climbing those walls over there in Egypt and in Libya. Your God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there is a vast difference between the two. Make no mistake about that. You gotta find out who your God is. And it'll get you, if you get, if you get your God right, then everything else will be right. <clears throat> so when that Jew says that Abraham is his father, I say, yes, he is. But Abraham had two sons. And the first son that Abraham had, he had it with a, with a horrible liaison with, with uh, Hagar, the Egyptian, brought on by him trying to help God out and a work of the flesh. And it produced Ishmael. And the Lord said in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 16, He said, Ishmael is a wild man. Now, how many of you today have ever watched the way Muslims conduct themselves would agree that they're wild men? The Bible's right again, isn't it? The Bible's right again. That was said 3,000 years ago. He said, His hand will be against his brother. Every man's hand will be against every man. They're wild men. And they are. That's long, obviously, long, long, long before Muhammad, 600 A.D. in the Muslim religion, but it goes back to the, to the Ishmaelite. 
As a matter, by the way, Ishmaelites are the ones Joseph was sold into slavery to. They were the ones who bought him and uh, carried him off down to Egypt and sold him down there. And I'm sure they made a good little profit in doing it. But it became a sovereign nation in 1948. It fought the War of Independence. It's fought a number of wars since then. The War of, the, the war of Attrition it fought. Then the War of 1967. Then the War of 1973, Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement. They were attacked by, by, uh, by Arab countries. Israel has fought over and over and over again for its survival. And in my lifetime, my little short lifetime, I have, uh, I have been witness to all that I told you about from May the 14th, 1948. Of course, then I was only two years old. There wasn't a whole lot of history I understood back then, but since then I've done a lot of reading about it, you know. I understand a little more. But the truth of the matter is, just in my short lifetime, I've seen the Bible fulfilled. I've seen prophecy fulfilled. Now, tonight we are at a grave time in the, in the history of Israel. Uh, our embassy was attacked in, in, uh, in, uh, in Libya. And uh, Libya, of course, is mentioned in the Scripture. It's North Africa. And along with Egypt, Libya and Egypt are old, 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 old countries. Ancient Egypt is called Mitzrayim in Scripture. And so Libya, our ambassador to Libya was murdered. And he was murdered and his body was drugged through the streets. And the more they find out, the more they realize it was probably an organized, orchestrated affair. And they only used this movie that was supposed to have been on YouTube as a pretense. Uh, to cover up what they intended to do. And so they murdered the man and they murdered uh, three other uh, with him. I have one question and I, nobody's answered it yet. Where were the Marines? That's right. Yeah. One of the first things they taught me when I went in the military was that Marines are stationed in embassy duty and they're stationed on board ship and they're stationed, of course, in camp and whenever, they, whenever they're stationed in his unit. Embassies have Marines patrolling them, stationed there. And so apparently they didn't have any firepower. They didn't have any real firepower, even though there was a battle, a gun battle that went on for three or four hours. They didn't have, they didn't have the military to support them. And so this man died. I got to thinking about that. I thought, you know, here is this huge superpower country, America, and we've lost one of our diplomats. We've lost a diplomat, folks. When you attack in the U.S. Embassy, you might as well attack a U.S. Uh, aircraft or a U.S. ship. It's sovereign territory. It's an act of war. It's an act of war. It falls under a different category. Uh, the U.S. Embassy is sovereign ground. When I was in Israel last time, I had to go to the embassy and, and I saw the flags of David everywhere. But then I looked off at a distance and I saw the stars and stripes flying in a foreign land. And that Stars and Stripes was flying over the U.S. Embassy. And it has a right to do that because that is American territory. But anyway, they attacked, assaulted it. And I thought, here is this huge superpower, huge. And yet people are fearful in this country and they're afraid of Islam. Yeah. That, that, the, that the Muslim, and don't, this, don't listen, when they say radical Islam and radical Muslim, Folks, let that go in one ear and out. That's meaningless. That's right. That's right. Muslims, what we're talking about, okay? These Muslims are uh, intimidating the whole world, intimidating the whole country now. How would you feel if you were that little country over there on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea? And on your northern border was a Muslim nation. On your, nor on, your, on, your, on your northeastern border is a Muslim nation. On your eastern border is a Muslim nation. And on your southern border is a Muslim nation. That you are surrounded with people who have sworn by Allah that they will wipe you from the face of the earth. And just imagine that you have an enemy, sworn enemy, just a few hundred miles east of you who is working night and day to create an atomic weapon that they're going to use on you just as soon as they get it. And then you appeal to the President of the United States of America as the Prime Minister of that nation as a last resort to try to do everything you possibly can before you go to war because nobody in their right mind wants war. All the glory in war, there's no glory when you get on the battlefield. That's right. What you find on the battlefield our bodies blown all to pieces, young men bleeding and dying. 
And so the Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, Prime Minister of, England, of uh, Israel, tries to communicate with the President of the United States to get some kind of communication going to where let's, what, what can we do to stop this imminent threat? The President has him hauled around and him hauled around and him hauled around and now finally the President of the United States had set a tentative time to meet September the 27th with his Prime Minister. Now he has told him he's not going to meet with him. He's not going to meet him. He's not going to meet with him. Yesterday, Benjamin Netanyahu gave a speech, and in it he said, we have tried our best to get the nations of the world to draw a red line. That if Iran crosses that red line, then, then obviously we're ready for war. Now, since you will not establish a red line, why should you expect us to adhere to any red line you draw? To paraphrase him, in other words, we have to look out for the survival of our country. It's going to be more than that. It's going to be more than survival of the country. I firmly believe that if it goes into a war, I believe that it's going to pull the world into it. World War I was started. Did you know that when that Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated in World War I that it was two weeks, I think two weeks, before anything was done? For the first few days, nothing happened. No big deal. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff started building. So <clears throat> when, this, when this happens, and Israel will strike Iran, they will strike them. They will strike Iran. When that, when that moment comes, then you're going to see Bible prophecies to start accelerating before your eyes. You're living probably in the terminal generation. It should excite you. It should excite you. It should. There's too many things happening too quickly now just to pass it off is meaningless. And I know somebody said, well, oh, it's ho-hum. I've heard this. Yeah, I know. I've, that's what they said you'd say. <laughs> that's what the Bible said you'd say. <laughs> exactly. Where is the promise of His coming? Since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were. You know, mocking the second coming of Christ. Like, well, we've heard that all of our life. He's not coming back. Don't kid yourself. Amen. He said, if I go away, if I go, I will come again. Amen. Did he come the first time? Amen. He'll come the second time. Amen. And that's the only hope the world, the world has, is that second coming of the Lord Jesus. And he will come again. Now, here's our dilemma. Our dilemma is that we have an antichrist at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue an Antichrist at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. A, a plays with a Muslim religion. He's not a dedicated Muslim or he wouldn't be drinking anything. And he wouldn't have a ham sandwich or anything like that. But he plays with it. He says he likes the sound of the, uh, of the, of the minaret tower, the prayer tower and all that. It's obvious that he's bowed down before the king of Saudi Arabia, that he's apologized to the Muslim countries that he's tried to kowtow to them and, and lower the United States before their sight. The embassy in, in Egypt right now is being assaulted. The Muslim Brotherhood has called for another assault tonight. On the, and when I say tonight, they're five hours ahead of us. So but when, they, when they assaulted that embassy last night, the United States Embassy in, in, in Egypt sent out a statement and I can't quote it verbatim, but the statement was essentially apologizing for the effect that the film might have had on the Muslim people. This film that we're talking about was posted on YouTube. It was never, pub it was never broadcast in the theaters in this country. It was produced on a budget of about $5 million by a Jew, an Israeli Jew, who's an Amer apparently an American citizen, or at least while he's here. And it, it was pub, it was broadcast. It was produced. He lives in Florida. It was produced over a period of time, and put on the on the uh, on YouTube. And a few people saw it. The innocent Muslim, I think, is the name of it. And of course, he goes back historically, and portrays Muhammad according to the uh, history books and what they say about him and what have you. And he offends the Muslims. He offends them greatly. But as I said before the Al-Qaeda or whoever it was used that as a pretext to assault that embassy and kill that, uh, that uh, diplomat, that ambassador there in the embassy in Libya. So now what's happening? 
What's happening tonight? What will be happening in 24 hours from now? Who saw this coming? What will happen by now on Sunday? What could be happening this time next week? By this time next week, could the bombs be falling? Could the aircraft carriers be moving? Could World War III have started? When it starts between two nations, it can escalate quickly by opportunistic nations and so forth. It can escalate very quickly. The Illuminati has been planning for generations to wipe black and brown people from the face of this earth. Let me say it one more time. It is the white elite brotherhood. They only use people. And when they get ready, they will, they will cleanse the earth of the unwanted. They've said time and again, the earth must reduce its population. They believe that they have been given, whatever they call it from up in the stars, a mandate to, 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 ex, to purge and, 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 and propagate themselves because they are better than you. They are the elite. If you ever listen to Henry Kissinger, and I'll bring you some quotes from Kissinger, you need to hear what uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski has to say. You need to hear what some of these people have said publicly as it relates to how much greater they are than you. And they have a right to control you. And they're going to get rid of the brown and the black people. And they're going to foment revolution. They're going to create chaos. They're going to turn people against each other. That gives them a pretext for stepping in and taking total control. This war that's coming, World War III, is going to be the war if World War III breaks out and Jerusalem becomes a burdensome stone and a cup of trembling, you'll hear a shout and the Son of Man will come from the eastern skies. Now, that excites me. It really does. The Lord Jesus said in the book of Luke, He said, when you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. He said, when that day comes, look up because it's time He's coming back. Now, you know, sometimes when things happen, you, you, you've thought about it so much, you've had it, you've had it in your mind so long, that when the reality of it happens, it's hard to grasp. It is. It's hard. For, like tonight, let's say you are the terminal generation. Let's say you're the last one. Let's say you're it. And the Lord Jesus comes back. Most people aren't really excited about that because they really don't believe it. Because it's so hard to believe that after all these years, it comes down to us. But it may very well come down to us. <laughs> it may very well come down to us. And if you really mean that, even so come, and you're looking toward the heavens. The Bible said, he that hath this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. I don't believe in a split rapture, but I do believe this. I believe that he'll prepare for himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. What's that mean? That means that if you're truly born again, he will awaken you. He'll wake you up and get you ready for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the seventh month, the tenth day of the month was Yom Kippur. That's what it's called, the Day of Atonement. The great high priest would go into the tabernacle. He'd go into the tabernacle. He would offer the sacrifice to the people that's only done once a year, receive the blessing from God. He would turn around and come back out. And the people stood out there waiting for him. They were waiting for their high priest to come back out. He'd been in the presence of God. He was going to bless them for another year. So he would come back out. And he would pronounce the blessing upon the people that God had given him. He blessed them. The Bible says that our great high priest shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's gone in to receive the blessing. He will come out for those that look for his appearing. That's what it says. He will appear the second time without sin. The sin has been taken care of. He will appear the second time without sin unto salvation. In other words, to be saved from the wrath to come. 
for those that look for his appearing. Thank you, Jesus. Now think about how horrible it was in Matthew chapter number 24 and 25. For the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Five wise, five foolish virgins. I don't know how many times I've heard Arminian, Arminian preachers uh, preach that you can lose your salvation and use that text. That's right. They wear it out. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. Folks, there is not a Christian to be found in Matthew 24 and 25. That's all Jewish. That's all Jewish. They even get so arrogant as to say, My Lord delayeth His coming. He has met with them. When does He meet with them? He's going to come and He's going to meet with Israel. When does He do that? He does that after He catches His bride up to meet him in the clouds. He takes us away. Then he comes back and has a meeting with the Jews. He has a meeting with them. He appears to them. And in that appearance to them, which takes place in the tribulation period, because it's the time of Jacob's trouble, he tells them that he will come and he will receive them and for them to look for his appearing. When does that take place? Probably in the middle of the tribulation when Moses and Elijah are raptured up and the tribulation saints are caught up. The tribulation saints are the Gentiles. Most of the tribulation saints in the tribulation in that first part are Gentile believers that are caught up to meet Him in the clouds. Then the focus is upon the Jew because the Jew then becomes the focal point of all the wrath of the Antichrist. He pours out His wrath against the Jew. And the Lord Jesus makes that appearance to them because He's promised they're the apple of His eye. What do they do? They wait for His coming. His coming as at the end of the tribulation period. He comes for Jacob. He comes for Israel. He comes to catch him up, to meet him in the clouds. And when He comes to catch him, they're going to be looking for Him. If they're not looking for Him, then the Bible says there are that group that says, Though my Lord delayeth His coming, they've lost their oil. When He does come, one goes out and says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they go out and cry that He's coming. And they say, we don't have any oil. The Holy Ghost is not with us. He's departed from us. That's not a Christian, folks. These are Jews in the tribulation. He's departed from us. Give us of your oil. No, we can't do that. We've only got enough for ourselves. And so at the end of that tribulation period, right before the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, He'll come and catch those Jews up to meet Him, and they will go with Him and with the bride of Christ, and they'll be there invited, Psalm 45, to sit down with Him, invited guests with the marriage supper of the Lamb, that's us. They'll be sitting there as witnesses, and then when He rises with the family of God, He'll rise with the whole family of God, Thank you, Lord. And he'll mount that horse, war horse, and the heavens will roll back. And when he comes, it's for no rapture, no peace, and no salvation. When he comes this time, he comes as a man of war. And the blood will flow as high as a horse's bridle. And Isaiah 63 will say, who is this that cometh? Who is this that's coming? with dyed garments from Basra, with blood splattered all over his apparel, he answers us and I am he that mighty to save. That's who's coming. And he'll come. And he'll come. And when he comes, he'll come and he'll take that which rightfully belongs to him. You pray that America has got enough sense not to be on the battlefield to fight against him at the second advent and try to support some Muslim uh, uh, moon god. You pray that America has got enough sense to support Israel and support them into what's coming. And the way I see it tonight, the only hope this nation has of supporting Israel in the coming days, in the coming wars, is to get rid of that man at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, give him an early retirement, let him go play golf from now on. He can just golf himself to death. <laughs> All right. And put somebody in that office. And Mitt Romney's the only man that can do it. You can't vote for Ron Paul. If you vote for Ron Paul, you're throwing your vote away. 
a vote for Ron Paul is a vote for Barack Obama. Yes. Mitt Romney is not running for pastor in chief. You're not voting to put a, a Mormon in office. I'll do a thing with you on the Mormon religion sometime. I don't know the, if there's anything about the Mormon religion that I agree with. But he's not running as a pastor. He's running as a president. And Mitt Romney's not a perfect man. Neither is Paul Ryan. But they are infinitely better than the two that's in there right now. They have come out and made it plain that they will stand with Israel. They have made it plain that they do not believe in the killing of the unborn. They have made it plain that they believe marriage is between a man and a woman. And then a lot of other things that they've stated. So if you can go down to the polls and you can vote for Barack Obama, knowing what he's done and how he's turned against Israel and how he's a sodomite enabler, and he's one of the worst supporters of abortion that's ever been in the White House. If you can go vote for him, don't come back and tell me all about your Christian testimony and experience. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I have never before in an election become so involved and so adamantly uh, opposed to the one in the White House as I have this one. But I have never before in an election seen it so critical as it is this time. It is critical. If I don't have any other reason to go vote in November, it is to go down there and say, I support you, Israel. Here's some of the things he said about Israel. He said this in Genesis 12, 3. He said, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. I don't want the curse of God on me. I will bless them. I will bless Israel. I will support Israel. I will support Israel regardless of what the government of the United States does. I will support Israel. And I believe there are millions in this country that feel exactly like I do about it. And let me tell you something about the Jew. This is anti-Zionist time. The anti-Zionist fever is running wild in this country. I mean, I marvel. I marvel at it. I don't know of a Jew that's ever killed an American ambassador. I don't know of a Jew that's ever burned down an American property. I don't know of a Jew that's ever done anything like that. And yet, and yet these liberal media fall over themselves backwards to make excuses for the Muslim and try to, and try to set them in a good light. But no Muslim gave me that Bible. No Muslim gave me that Bible. If Charles Martel had not stopped the Muslim onslaught in Europe hundreds of years ago, he's called the hammerer because <laughs> he carried a big hammer into, into battle. And he just went in there knocking heads off. <laughs> That's the way he fought. But back then, folks, they just hacked and hacked and cut and slashed with, with, uh, with, with mace and with chains and with, and with, with, with uh, hammers and with swords and clubs or whatever they had. Just beat each other down to the ground. That's the way war was fought back then. And Charles Martel, uh, at the Battle of Tours, stopped the Muslim onslaught. Stopped it. Stopped it dead in its tracks. That's the reason right now, folks. That's the reason. And you need to know that. That's the reason that in America, in the southern states and in the northern states and in the western states, that you had the opportunity to read a Bible is because that man, his army, stopped the Muslims in Europe. Make no mistake about it. Go check me out. If he had not stopped them, the same thing would have happened to you that has happened to every other country. They would have cut your throat if you didn't convert to Islam. And a lot of times they'll cut your throat anyway, even if you do. Now that's a fact of history. We have a debt to pay. That is a Jewish Bible. <laughs> and the one who was born of the virgin 2,000 years ago, bless his holy name, was born of a, of a, of a virgin daughter of Zion. <laughs> Jewish mother, a Jewish virgin, Mary. And he was born of her. 
So the Jew gave me my Bible and the Jew gave me my Savior. I can't do anything tonight but love the Jew. And I understand the Rothschilds and the international bankers and all of that. I've been teaching on that for weeks, but I still love the Jew because they gave me this book. And you should too, and you should love Israel. Amen. Father, in thy name we pray. I've said what you put on my heart, Lord. I don't know what else to say. I don't know how to make it any plainer. I don't. I don't know how to make it any plainer. This is the most critical election this nation has ever had. It will determine who we are and what we are and who we support. In thy name we pray. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. I'll do a little thing in Sunday school before too long about the Democrat and Republican Party.